Hello and welcome back to Memoirs of a Narc's Wife. I'm Teresa, this is my niece, Julia, and today we have a very special guest. Welcome, my nephew, Patrick. Thank you. Today's topic, narcissism in the LGBT plus community. Patrick, yeah. thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Can my you, brother. This is my brother. Can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you. I sound raspy. You're you fine. sound great. You're okay. fine. Okay. Let's just jump right in. Okay. So you have stated that you've experienced narcissism in the gay community. Yes. Can you tell us when that happened to you and what exactly you experienced? That would be... That happened around the first time in my first relationship with with somebody. Um, I was about 17, and this, was, this person was a friend, a brother of a friend of mine that I was very close to in high school. And she had introduced us. He was older. Mm-hmm. And we met, started talking. And it was almost instantly where... They, I would call them, and they would never call back. I would text them, they would never text back. But I was always made to feel like I was valued. By him? Yes. So when he would, would call and talk to me, it was, your, your, it's great to talk to you. I want to take you here. I, you know, it was charming, charming, very like, and I was new. Nobody told me anything about relationships at that point. Mm. So why would I didn't necessarily believe that anybody would when hurt you, me? When you're saying you're <clears throat> new, do you you mean like you were new to the dating scene? Yes. Okay. I was new to pretty much all of that. And at that time, you had already come out. Yeah. Yes, I was probably only really a few months actually. Of coming out. I came out officially at 16, but I didn't start dating really until close to 17. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so you were new to the dating scene and this guy comes in and he's charming, but you're seeing like red flags, if you will. I would notice red flags now, but at the time, right. nobody would have, I, you couldn't tell me what was wrong or right. But I remember it being really great it felt really great to be around somebody who was like me somebody who cared for me as somebody who's had issues with men in their life this was a good break having that sort of male attention as time went by i started noticing like words i recognize now as being i was being put down Mm -hmm. i was being told devalued devalued Mm -hmm. i was being not treated well can you give us an example of what type of statements that he made that would make you feel like not good or whatever brought you down there was one particular moment that really stuck with stuck stuck with me and even to this day sort of sticks with me Mm -hmm. i had asked him at one point if i was attractive if i was good looking and he looked me dead in the eye and he said you're average looking Mm. To this day, I don't know what that meant. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was a compliment, if it was a backhanded compliment. I don't know. Or if he was just trying to like put you down. Yeah, I have no idea what that statement meant, but it stuck with me. It clearly affected you if you're still speaking about it this minute. To this day, how I Mm -hmm. view myself literally goes back to that time, Mm -hmm. that moment, that phrase. And And then it progressed to verbally being put down. Like? Like being told, I don't have time for you right now. I, it's just not important to me right now. And all the while, I'm six, you know, 16, 17, I have no idea. And I, at times, literally get physically ill when this person would not pick up their phone, would not call me. Wow. wow. I, like, to the point where my mother was concerned. Mm-hmm. But all I wanted was to be around this person. Right. All, it's all I wanted. How do you feel? Because this question that you asked your ex, you had said that it haunts you to this day. And you you did answer like how it affects you. Um, 
do, it affects you as a man, as a gay man, like it, it affects it, my whole being. It affects my whole being of who I am as a person. Because being a man, being gay, being I that was the first time I really got the introduction to how my community relies a lot on physical attributions. Oh. Hmm. I didn't interpreted it at that time. But that was the, the 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 foundation to what I would eventually realize as time went on. Remember this person was older than me by like three years. Mm -hmm. okay. So and that may not seem like a lot, but in life experiences right. that is a lot. Yeah, you, especially being sixteen, so that means this person was already an adult. Right. I already had significant more experience than I did. Mm -hmm. And that insecurity and that being broken down to literally nothing, that affected me for years as far as how I interacted in relationships, how I interacted with men, how, what I would look for in a partner, because I thought these things just weren't they were. Like normal. Like normal. Right. You right. had said before in our conversation uh, prior that you felt that this experience and interaction with this man put you on a trajectory or like a direction of how, how to date. Right. Expound on that if you can. I find my, I found myself being attracted to broken men. Mm. <laughs> wow. That's, I mean, that's exactly I how it works. But yes. I didn't understand those were the type of men. Mm -hmm. I just thought they were, they had issues. You thought that at that time? Yeah, like I thought, well, yeah, because I didn't have the proper terminology to recognize what a broken person was. I just thought, oh, they have issues. Oh, you know, they don't get along with their parents very well. Oh, maybe they may not have the greatest friend dynamic. Or, you know, they may just, may, may not take certain things too seriously, but we were young. Mm -hmm. So I didn't think anything of it. It wasn't until I would say my second relationship after this one. And I really did care and like this person. We were friends in high school. Mm -hmm. and we The second person? The second person. We you know, decided maybe there was something there. That lasted only a month because I was crazy. What do you mean? I did not trust. Oh. I so was you weren't crazy. You felt like you were I going felt crazy. I needed the attention. Mm. I needed to, when that phone, when I called you, I needed that phone to be picked up right away. I needed that text message to be responded to be right away. Do you attribute that to the neglect from the first relationship yeah. oh, so yeah. now you have a so you're now your expectations i was afraid of being rejected being rejected mm -hmm. and that feeling again that of being basically of being played with mm. you know you had said that you feel rejected by men or you had felt rejected by men and by people in your own community mm -hmm. I never started off great relationships with men. I'm talking about in terms of my, my male parental <clears throat> figures. I didn't have strong maleship like that. So I was looking for the opposite of that. I wanted that. But I started finding myself being rejected based on personal appearances, based on if I did or did not drink, if mm. I didn't want to hang out with particular people. But I was so wanting not to be alone that I would literally surround myself oh, with my anybody goodness. who would have me. Like this Friends, is... putting myself in positions and in predicaments that not that I knew were destructive, but I wanted to be included. included. You know, you, you didn't have your dad's, either your dad or your stepdad. Um, in, in the way that you really needed to give you the direction and the guidance that would have helped foundationally for you to um, just to be a man. Right, just to be a strong person. Period. Yeah, to, right. just to be a man. But And then to go into, you know, dating the dating scene and not mm -hmm. have any clue, you know, on how to handle things. Do you feel like um, you were looking for like a, a dad type filler do you feel like you felt that at that time? I don't even know if I'm not even saying that right, but like a, um, you know, when they say that you have mommy issues, right. daddy issues, you, you right. look That's for what I was thinking. Definitely. I, I wanted the love and attention of a man because I really didn't have it. Cause that's mm -hmm. what you were lacking. That's what I was lacking. Mm -hmm. 
I have two great, wonderful parents, but at the time that I, two sets of parents, but at the time I was recovering from rejection. Mm-hmm. I was on one side of my family and then I had another side who was accepting, but also who were emotionally and distant. Mm-hmm. So I was left on my own for many, for those critical times in my years, I was on my own. So yes, I was looking for that sort of filler of my of my my male figures in my life, my mm-hmm. parents. So a lot of the older, a lot of people, yes, they were older. They were mm. older. They were older. And I think that set me up for that kind of manipulation, yes. that kind of gaslighting, because I didn't know any better. And they knew that. And they knew that. First of all, I'm sorry. Mm. I'm sorry for what you suffered and what, you know, the neglect and... Um, the pain that you endured, not even knowing what it was about or where it was coming from. So we love you. And, <laughs> and, and, and I'm, I'm grateful that you've grown and that you have awareness now, which is why we wanted you on the show. Um, you had said about um, narcissism doesn't play out the same mm-hmm. for verse, gay versus straight. Right. Um, can you elaborate on that? I don't think it's recognized in our community. I mm. don't think we see that as... I think what we see narcissism as, as somebody's looking in the mirror too much or the guy who's okay. doing gym selfies. We see it on... I think it's... Vanity. It's a vanity issue. It's more okay. on the outside. We, I don't think it's talked about or recognized. It, what it really means when two people are in a relationship and how one partner is. We don't see it that way. There's the layers of it. Hmm. So I have been in instances where I have seen extreme gaslighting, Hmm. like beyond, to the point where even I'm like, you don't... Does anybody else see this? You don't see that, you know? (laughs) And then when we're confronted or when you confront or you tell them about it, it's automatic defensiveness. Mm -hmm. That's what my community really does a lot is defense because we learn how like no taking accountability right right because we we've we've learned to put up a big defense around us and rightfully so Mm we have a lot of people who love us and a lot of people who to this day don't like us our community in general still so i think what happens is the hurt that we have as individuals we then turn it on the people we love or we're in relationships with because we don't want to be the one that gets hurt first. Mm -hmm. And we, and I, from my experience, when I, you know, um, ghosted somebody was because I didn't have the, the, I didn't know how to say, you know what, this isn't going to work out for us. This is not, it's not working. It's easier to block and never speak again. Wow. But, you know, it's we just we don't it i don't want to say all of us but in my instances in my instance we didn't i didn't know how to let go of somebody Navigate. properly mm-hmm. but what do you feel is the difference because you're saying you didn't think that it played out the same in your community versus the heterosexual community in what way i in in what way i think okay so and you and i've talked about this before where People assume abuse is strictly physical. Right. It, it's if if they're not putting their hands on you, right. it's not abuse. Right. Right. We don't go into the layers of emotional and mental and all that oh, stuff. Right. But when I have actually looked at narcissism in when I looked it up in in the gay community, it brings up none of the emotional, the 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 mental aspect. It's all physical. Oh. But if you look at narcissism in heterosexual relationships, in general, then you will mm-hmm. see emotional, mental, and usually the part of the woman. So I won't say that it's different. I think it's not talked about and it's not recognized. Therefore, it's not an issue, but it is. Because it's kind of your guys' is normal. I mean, right? Right. right. Yeah. right. Okay. You know, right. Because again, we, and it's no secret, you know, a lot of the gay community is very physical. It's very how you look, how you dress, who you're with, mm. right? Appearances sake. So for us, that's as far as narcissism goes. It doesn't go any deeper than that. 
So you have a lot of relationships like mine, like people like no, who don't realize that there's layers Mm -hmm. to this. But I couldn't find anything on Google, on anything that brought up the same kind of behaviors behaviors in this community versus this one. One was physical only. The other one is no, it's emotional, mental. It's Mm. so it's there's a there's a chasm between. No, it's. It all is the same, mm-hmm. but it's not talked about. It's not recognized. What do you think is important? I mean, obviously, we're talking about, you know, we're, we're, we are raising awareness in this moment by, by just drawing attention to the fact that it's not as talked about from your understanding or from your circles of friends. Um, what would you like to bring to light? What would you like to say in regards to what you've experienced and, and how how you would like there to be improvement in the gay community in regards to narcissism? Like, what would you like to draw more attention to? I think really the issue in and of itself. I think that... Just that it's an issue? No, not that it's an issue, but that people are suffering in these types of relationships and they have nowhere to turn. Mm. And they don't know why. No, they don't know why. They don't know why their partner wants to have multiple sex partners. They don't know why their partner's staying out all night. They don't know why they're, when why when they call their partner out on something, it gets extremely defensive and they don't, and it's in turn flipped on you. Like, what are you doing? You're crazy. You're yes. you're this and that, right? Mm-hmm. When, you know, there's, there, there's a lot of mental health for in my community for coming out. Right. There's a lot of mental health for dealing with, you know, the criticism, the, the criticism the, and all right. that stuff. Right. But there's no, there's no real thing like, Hey, if you're in an abusive relationship, here's this help. Right. Mm-hmm. Or physically really, mm-hmm. there's not even a lot of that for physical abuse for the gay community. Right. You know, and cause our community, unfortunately to this day is still very boxed in. So, what do it's you mean e- by that? So it's either HIV is your issue or it's gay marriage is your issue. Okay. It's there's the issues are already sort of pre outraged for you in a sense. So these are the only issues you can talk about. Hmm. You know, all the only ones that make sense. But it's like, no, there's a whole underlining problem of people mm-hmm. who are broken mm-hmm. getting with other broken people. And it turns and then it becomes toxic. And then it becomes <laughs> Who can break the last? Who can break this one the last? Mm-hmm. Right? Who can be, you know? And that was in my instance, in my case, as many times where I was like, okay, either I'm gonna break you or you're gonna break me. But one of us will be broken mm-hmm. because I don't wanna be the one to be hurt. You don't wanna be the hurt one, the one to hurt either. And it's like that. It almost becomes a rivalry. And then when you seek out these, these services, they don't exist. They don't, not, it's not that they don't exist, but they're not well equipped. Mm. And having gay and lesbian LGBT therapists or psychologists is rare. Is it? It's very rare. It's very rare. So, you know, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm saying this in perspective, but, you know, I think when a woman goes to a gynecologist, I think it's probably more comfortable for them to be with a woman right. versus a man. So for us, you know... You want to talk to a we gay want to talk somebody who understands where we are, and it's so hard to find. So we just deal with it, mm. and we just let or it don't fest- deal with or it. don't deal with it, and it just festers. And then you just create one person who's just broken, running through the community, hurting everybody, creating more of them, and so on, so on. And then you have a community who just has such an existential crisis and identity, but they have no idea why. You know, we've been talking about about therapy and about help, um, raising awareness and such, and how you guys are coping and dealing with this, if you're even aware of it. But we haven't touched on faith. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like you're saying, like you, you, you guys either don't deal with it um, or you're, you're meeting with people that are not equipped. What about diving into your faith in God? for healing do you feel that it's available do you feel that the gay community feels or the lgbt excuse me community feels like it's available to them no why we've been told it's not how 
for an example, um, when I came out, uh, you know, our, our family's very Christian in that regard. And this was was many years ago. I was cut off. You were rejected. I was rejected. And what was said to you by those faith-filled people? I was told from a certain somebody, my faith doesn't allow me to have you in my life. Mm. That was it. So it's not that it it's not that it wasn't obtainable to me, but I why would I want it? Why would I want to be like these people? Who rejected you? Yeah. To be honest. I see I view the Bible as a book. It's a book. No different than any other book on the shelf. How it's used is entirely a different matter and who uses it. So do you feel like the Bible has been weaponized yes. against you? Oh yeah. And the gay community. Definitely. You go anytime we I mean if you go to a pride parade, there's they're there. Oh. If you go to Who's they? You know, the, Christian? the God hates fags church or you know, what their signs and all that. Yeah. We know. We know. Do you have a faith in God? I do. Do you feel that your faith has brought you through and out of um, difficult and painful situations in your life? It has allowed me to forgive. Mm, yeah. It has allowed me to sympathize for those who condemn me. And it has allowed me to push aside that pride to want to be angry. So there was a point after um, I had come out that I was, I was, I was very hurt. I was very angry. Um, to the point where I didn't honestly didn't want to live a small portion. I didn't want to live anywhere. I had never had that kind of, so I was very, and it, and it really Were you affected. angry at when you say that, are you saying you, were you angry at yourself because the choice or the life that you were living or were you, because you didn't understand I, it, I, or were you angry at people for rejecting you and not accepting you? Yeah. I, I, I never thought I would be rejected by my family. Mm -hmm. Now I knew that there was, well, let me start off by saying I, I didn't get to tell them. Mm. I was, that was done for me. Mm which that should not have happened. So I had some sort of expectation of what could have happened, but that was not what I had expected. And I played it off as I didn't care at first, but then as time went on, it, it did. Mm -hmm. It really did. And I will never forget, I was, um, I was at home, I was reading, and I happened to turn to the book of Job. And in Job 38, 11, there's a verse that says, when I said, this far you may come, but no farther, and here your proud waves must stop. And when I read that, I saw it as... God spoke to you right yeah. there. Mm -hmm. And he and I got from that was, you don't need to feel this way anymore. I'll take care of it. Mm -hmm. I got it. And three years later, my family started coming around. Mm -hmm. And there was no bitterness there was no hostility. There was no anger. I never held it against them. I just welcomed my family back into my life. Because I realized at that moment, I didn't need to hold anything against them. That was going to be taken care of for me. Mm -hmm. And I have lived throughout my life as best as I can to that verse. Because that verse still speaks to me. And I, that has helped me in dealing with relationships and friends, when I feel that I'm taking things too far, I always revert back to that that scripture and I say, okay, what am I doing wrong? Okay, Lord. Yeah, okay, you I'm, got I'm being too proud again in my ways. Mm. Bring me back a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it does. Amen. And it has. So I think that is one of the things I think needs to, why I really wanted to bring that up is because yes, 
even though I'm gay and even though I've been told all these things, when I needed to the most, I turned to the word and I found what I needed to cope and to survive and ultimately to forgive. What a gift. Wow. So beautiful. (laughs) (laughs) I just wanted to take a moment to tell you how much I love you and how sorry I am for um, being one of those people at one time that did not receive you. And I know you know this, that God loves you so much, that God loves the LGBT plus community, and that we are not here today at all by any means to shame your community, to um, even debate the Bible, our faith. We are here simply because there's power in your testimony Mm -hmm. and we want to bring awareness to the fact that there's a problem in the gay community, in the LGBTQ community. And we would like to draw attention to the problem that's there, but we would also like to invite your community to a relationship with Jesus Christ because that is the way that Teresa and I have received healing in this journey of experiencing narcissistic abuse. He is the almighty healer and redeemer. So thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for bringing awareness. Thank you for being so brave and so strong. (laughs) Thank you for not giving up on your faith in Christ, uh, regardless of the rejection that you have received. And um, will you pray over him? Yes. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time, Lord. We just want to come before your throne room right now. And and I just lift up um, my nephew, Father God. I pray for his um, heart plead the blood of Jesus over his mind and his thoughts. Thank you, Father God, for revealing yourself to him. Thank you for ministering to him when he was feeling abandoned and rejected, Father God. Thank you for showing him how much you love him, Lord. And Father, I just pray that this um, podcast, even speaking about it, would bring some sort of healing and restoration to his continued journey, Father. I pray for those that are listening, Lord, that they would receive something of value, Lord, to be able to um, download to their own lives, to be able to have forgiveness, to be able to um, move forward, Lord, without harboring any bitterness. And Father, I just pray that you would bring those therapists, that you would bring the help that you would bring alongside um, anyone, not not just in in this community, but those that are suffering, which is what our, the the narcissism, which is what our, our our entire mission here is, is to bring the awareness and have redemption in Christ. So, Father God, we thank you for um, allowing Patrick to be here and to speak on on and to share his experiences, Father. And we just uh, love you and we praise you and we all glory and honor goes to you. May you be glorified in what we're saying and what we're doing. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Can I just, Amen. I want to add, um, God, I just want to ask that you would send out your Holy Spirit and that you would touch the lives of the LGBT plus community. God, that you would draw their hearts to you, Lord, and that they would um, sense your love and compassion for them. And I want to thank you. Thank you, God, for your unconditional love. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the work that you are going to do Mm in this community. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you're ready to take steps forward after narcissistic abuse, 
then my life coaching services could benefit you. Just go to our website and click on the services tab for more information. I look forward to working with you. Also, if you're interested in any of our resources from today's episode, just check the description below.